Welcome to This One's On Me, where I, Snail Dada, invite you to come and be a part of other people's lived experiences. So, my guest today is Grant Rex, whom I can now safely say is my hero. Well, actually, after hearing bits of his story that he is about to share with you. You see, Grant made headlines during his time as an anti-apartheid activist, but not just any type of headlines. He was what you now call today a real gangster. So I was brought up in Benoni on the East Rand, and the reason for that confession is that we were beaten up, us English-speaking white kids were beaten up regularly by the Afrikaans kids. Whenever I caught the train to school in Boxburg, uh, it was a risky endeavor. And by the age of about 12, I decided this can't carry on. I need to, to do something to protect myself. So I started doing karate and took it quite seriously. And the reason for that part of the story will become clearer later. When I arrived at, at WITS, which was segregated in those days, out of 16,000 students, uh, only, well, I think there were about seven to 800 black African students. It, it was quite clear that it couldn't carry on like that. I mean, I was doing medicine, the, the, the few black students in my class out of 200 students, I think there were about four or five, were not able to, to do their practicals in the Joburg General uh, Charlotte Makeke Hospital these days. Um, although we could go to Barra and do our practicals there. So there were so many, you know, moral dilemmas that were just completely outrageous. We became radicalized quite quickly and I, I was recruited into the ANC underground, but that's another story for another time. Part of that uh, at the time was, was an idea that we had to influence the white community to not go to the army and to resist conscription because, of course, every white male uh, over the age of 16 was forced to go to the army. And if they didn't, they, they had a choice of going to jail for up to, up to six years. So we were trying to campaign to get whites to think about going into the army because the army was increasingly used to go into the townships and to prevent people from protesting against the, the unfairness of apartheid basic things like a totally inferior education. I think at the time about a hundred rand a year was spent on a black child's education and about a thousand rand on a white child's education. So it, they were, you know, s such serious problems that um, we felt we had to try get the army out of the townships. One of the things that the ANC felt was that I should take a higher profile role and I stood for the WITS SRC and became SRC president in 84, 85. Part of that year, we, we, we built up student support for calls to, to desegregate the university, to eliminate Bantu education, and we, we started testing out uh, the Riotous Assemblies Act, which meant that you couldn't protest, uh, you couldn't hold meetings, mass meetings, public meetings, you couldn't protest. And at the time, we were meeting in the Great Hall, and we gradually moved out onto the library lawns, and then we started testing whether we could move out onto the street around the university. Uh, we were trying to get into Jan Smuts Avenue. And the, the police responded by becoming more and more aggressive. Initially with shambooks, the students sat down initially and they would beat the students indiscriminately. But, you know, really, really just like punishing them for, for, for making their opinions known. And we were, we were trying to get the space to protest so that we could, you know, if we could do it at Witz in a, in a white university, in, at the time Bramfontein was Snow White, a pub like this, there, you know, no black, black people were allowed into it. That, that includes colors and Indians. Uh, most of the people sitting here wouldn't, well, wouldn't have been allowed in, in the room. And in the following year, we, the, the protests were continuing and the numbers were getting bigger and bigger. We were getting to mobilize three, four, five, six thousand students were coming out and protesting. And we got to the point approaching the 10th anniversary of the, the 76 uprisings in 1986, where we were really trying to get out onto the, onto the streets around, around Witz. And um, a march about two or three weeks before the big day that I want to tell you about, uh, we were, we were marching down from, from the Great Hall towards Jan, Jan Smuts Avenue between the dental school 
and the Holy Trinity Catholic Church. And I saw at the time a lot of the student leadership was in detention, but a, but a, a student uh, that was very charismatic, although also quite a small student, Faroz Kachalia, in the about 20 meters from me was grabbed by two plain clothes guys and dragged off and thrown into the back of a police van and taken away. Of course, he was being detained without trial. We didn't know how long he had been in detention for. Many, many of our colleagues had been in detention without trial, not having committed a crime, just trying to really express their views and protest. They were in detention for, for two, three years. So we didn't know when last, and I just felt, look, I don't want this to happen to me. And this is where my experience of being beaten up as, as a kid and the karate and so on came into play and I thought I'm going to get some self-defense and at the time there was an industrial type of anti-rape spray which was about this size and it sprayed about three meters so from here to the wall. Hectic. Uh, and I, I decided I was going to keep that on me in the backpack in these protests. So. We were protesting usually on a Wednesday afternoon and the, and the, the police would, would charge us, the riot police, they were, they were starting to use rubber bullets. And we got to the point where we were marching down Jansmatz Avenue and a, a, a policeman was running chasing a small student and I thought this is, I just can't take this anymore. So I reached into my bag, stepped in front of him sure. and bah, <laughs> gave it to him. <laughs> and he fell like a bag of potatoes. The student got away, which, which I was pleased about, but then I saw the police coming, coming for me and targeting me. I, I was quite athletic, so I managed to out-sprint them and get back into campus and, and get into the Wharton Wilder Library. And of course, they couldn't because they didn't have a student card. So I managed to... <laughs> so I managed to get in there, but I was sweating now. I mean, it was quite a sprint uphill and into the thing. Uh, grab a book and I sat there in, in a cubicle, you know, and, and they actually got in and they, they didn't see me. So I got away with it. The next day though, when the Star newspaper came out, there was a photo on the front page of me in this position, spraying the cop and the cop was falling. Uh, later that night, the security police came around and knocked on the door of where I was, a flat I was staying in Yeovil. And um, fortunately I wasn't there, but it was clear that I now had to you know, go into hiding, go on the run. One of my fellow SRC members who wasn't particularly political, but was very sympathetic, offered to put me up in, in his apartment in Jubei Park and gave me, he was a drama student, so he gave me a disguise of a, of a moustache and a, and a wig. And, and, um, and that's, that's how I spent my time for the next uh, month or two. But it eventually became clear that I had to write my exams. I was a fifth year medical student uh, I had to write my exams, they, they wrote earlier, around about October. So I reached out to the WITS uh, legal aid department and at the time Edwin Cameron, who later became a constitutional court judge, was, was working there, uh, giving support to, to students and to people who couldn't afford, who couldn't afford a lawyer. So he took my statement, he went down to the Hillbrow Police Station and he reported that I was available and uh, I'd, I'd face my charges. Now assault of a policeman was a serious thing and it meant I probably wouldn't be able to register as a doctor um, and I could face a sentence of several years in jail. Um, so it was quite a serious situation. Anyway, my case was heard in the Hillbrow Magistrates Court uh, and an Afrikaans judge. Fortunately, Edwin spoke very fluent Afrikaans and I think that helped. <laughs> so uh, he was, he was uh, cross-questioning the policemen about whether they had announced themselves because they were, they were in plain clothes, whether they'd revealed that, yeah, they are police and that we had a certain amount of time to disband and the policemen said, admitted quite honestly, no, they didn't do that. And while Edwin's cross-questioning this guy, he suddenly sees something in the photo. And then he says, is this you? The guy says, yes. He says, why aren't you wearing shoes? The guy was barefoot in the, in the photo. And he went and showed, showed the magistrate. And he said, how could these students know that these were policemen? You, you know, they, they didn't announce who they were and they were just beating up students at random. They weren't even told they had to disband. And the magistrate, uh, really f 
felt that that was a convincing argument and I was let off. I was basically found innocent. So that was an incredible defense that I'm, I'm very grateful for. As I was let off, they immediately arrested me and put me in detention for two weeks. Sure. And uh, that really just radicalized me even further. Of course, uh, uh, you know, a famous medical student, Neil Agate, had been killed uh, you know, a year or two before that in detention. And uh, he also was not guilty of any crime. He was, you know, just really opposing apartheid. And, and at that stage, more and more people were dying in detention. And so really it just radicalized me. And uh, that's another story for another time. Well, we are glad you lived to tell the tale, Brad. Such a privilege and an honor to meet people like you who did good and did not give up on our beautiful country. Thank you for joining us for another episode of This One's On Me. Until next time.